good video. Yeah. Does anyone? Wow. No. So, mm -hmm. My husband's like, you're going to do blackness, and I'm not going to try to do Okay. Um, thank you guys for coming. Maybe we'll get some more. I think the, the trouble with any conference where there's multiple levels is, or where things are happening in the keynote, is that people just stay in the keynote room. Yeah, so they the room. <laughs> and then eventually they realize, oh, there's stuff going on upstairs. So hopefully uh, more will, will filter up. Um, okay, so new distribution models for authors. Um, I'm going to start with See, I'm not being aware of that. I can yeah, probably we'll be off the camera in a second. Um, okay, so I wanted to start with uh, a verse or sort of two verses from a song that I'm particularly fond of. Alice Paul, the uh, folk singer, has a song called "Never uh, called Never Lived at All" or something like that. It's never be okay. You're nodding. Yes. Um, so here's here's a verse that I think is is interesting for this uh, this topic. The great American novel sits on top of Peter's kitchen table, 300 pages on a town he built inside of his head. He signs the cover page, uncorks the bottle with the dusty label, pours his wife a glass. She says, baby, bring the bottle to bed. At 6 a.m., he's out fighting the cars on the freeway and fighting his manuscript has he written his own downfall. But he'll embrace rejection. He'll kiss the seal of each envelope. Better to live in hope than to never have lived at all. Um, and I think it presents this at once romantic notion of the way that publishing your book is or has always been, but I think it also offers us, a, like, we don't want, a, why, why should that be what it is for, for authors? It's not that way for musicians, for photographers, for people doing video. I mean, it is to a certain extent, but I think People in those genres have moved outside the box, have moved outside the traditional models of distribution. Photographers have Flickr. Um, musicians can get their stuff on iTunes on every other store in the world uh, using, uh, I forget the name of the, the company, but there's a company that basically will let them, for a price, put it on all the stores. And of course, uh, people doing video have YouTube, have Fiddler, have whatever the heck they want to use. Um, writers, particularly writers of fiction, I don't think have that, and I think they are faced with the stigma of self-publishing, um, which is this sort of dirty word in, uh, in publishing circles. Um, I want to start by talking about uh, this guy who <laughs> writes a blog called Pimp My Novel, and there are lots of these industry insider blogs out there right now. Uh, a lot of them written by agents, some of them written by editors. This guy is talking about what happens, for the most part, at least his mission statement is, I'm going to talk about what happens after your book is acquired. But he does a lot of talking about, at least in what I've read so far, about self-publishing. And it's very, I don't want to, I don't want to say snarky, but it's, it's very uh, looking down on self-publishing. Um, and I think that's what we're doing as we put our stuff out there. As far as the publishing establishment is concerned, if I put it online, if I put it out as a book of my own, as I did um, with those little bastards back in 2002, it's self-publishing. Um, so here are some of the assumptions, he says. According to Pimp My Novel, self-publishing is great if ideas are targeted at a very specific market. He actually says family or a forced market, students. So if you're going to sell it to your family or you're going to make your students buy it, then self-publishing is great. Um, you if you have absolutely no interest in selling your work and merely want to see it in print before you die, that's another good reason to self-publish. So I just want to show you some of the attitudes that are out there in the industry towards people doing it on their own. Um, if you have no interest in selling your work and merely want to disseminate it widely online as an ebook, probably a free one. So it says, okay, you might be able to do it out there online, but you're probably not going to make any money at it. Or, and I love this perfect example of, uh, of the attitude. You don't have enough copies of other people's books to keep your coffee table level. <laughs> so th this, this is the attitude that's out there. Um, but aren't there a lot of similarities to any creative work? 
I mean, I think so. I just think. Well, having been a professional writer for 20 years, <laughs> yeah, and published in a traditional book contract, and also putting my own stuff out there every day on yeah. blogs and other avenues that mm -hmm. allow you to do a similar thing that Flickr or Vimeo right. or Vidler allow the other uh, other creative pursuits to do. It, the field is starting to level. I think the romanticism is really what gets an author because they want to see that advance check and have the yep. book tour. And I mean, even years ago, mm -hmm. probably when you had your book come out, mine came out in 2000, yeah. the book tour was dwindling already. People, our publishers didn't have the budgets to send you on a tour, so you were already doing that whole end of the right. business yourself. Yep. Um, but there definitely is a stigma, I yep. think, it's because of the danger. You don't want to go to a Vanity Press and dump thousands and thousands of dollars on something that's not going to make it. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right that the playing field is leveling. I would just say that I think that the playing field in publishing, in publishing works of fiction, is leveling slower than it's leveling anywhere else because of the romanticism. It's the last big industry to sort of fall. I mean, newspapers are falling, magazines are are, are failing, but the book industry is still sort of trying to hang on with these huge event books and huge advances and well, there's so, no mid no yeah. list anymore. Yeah, yeah, there's, yeah, there's, exactly. Um, here are some of the reasons he suggests uh, we might want to self-publish. Our books have been rejected by every agent out there and we have something to prove. Uh, we believe we can sell more on our own than we can with a publisher, so we're forgoing the whole system. Um, or we say we have no interest in selling our work and only want to disseminate it freely, but secretly hope that as soon as it's out there, we're gonna get calls from the silly agents and editors. So that it just this um, other thing he said, would you want videos of your very first piano lesson on CNN or your first creme brulee on Top Chef? No, that's essentially what you're asking for if you self-publish. So there's just this attitude of like, if you put it out there on your own, the, from the establishment, there's this attitude, if you put it out there on your own, you're really, shooting yourself in the foot. Um, then, he warn, then he gets into these sort of horror stories. They want to warn you against it. If you put it out there and you get an ISBN number, right, all of a sudden your sales are trackable um, by the publishers. And so the publisher sees that you can't sell your book, they're not going to want to you know, hook up with you, which is fine. That makes good business sense for them. But all of this is just sort of like, do not self-publish. Do not put your stuff out there on your own. Um, and I'll close with this in terms of what he had to say. 99.99% plus of the time, however, self-published books are either written by the functionally illiterate, are tangled messes of inane plot and one-dimensional characters, do not appeal to the vast majority of readers, are way too long or way too short, or some combination of all of these. In short, most self-published novels are crap. So. <laughs> most novels are. Most novels, most I mean, you can self-publish, not, pu yeah, right. most novels are, so most of the stuff out there, I mean, that's why you end up with a huge remaindered book section at the Harvard Bookstore. Yeah. Uh, the in, stuff that even got into print, and yeah. you haven't seen the umpteen thousands that didn't even get out of the slush pile. Yeah, I mean, it, there's a lot of, but I think the democratization of the whole thing is, is where we're, let the people decide what is crap and what's not crap. I did a uh, podcast interview with J.C. Hutchins, mm -hmm. and yeah. he and I talked for about 15 minutes uh, yeah. on one of my podcasts about his whole model. Yeah. And what he did, he went into a podcast model. Mm -hmm. He wrote a 1,100, 1,200-word 1200 yeah. uh, book, which then was chopped into a trilogy. Mm -hmm. But he wrote that book, and for the first third, he 11, put it out 12, there. 12,000? Yeah, 11, um, 1,200 pages. Oh, 1,200 pages. Okay, sorry. I thought you were saying words, and yeah. I was like, oh, that's 1,200 really pages. <laughs> um, for the first third of the book, he put it yeah. out as podcast episodes to gauge interest. Yeah. And he had more and more people. I mean, this is yeah. one out of so many, but he was looking at the new media model mm -hmm. as a way to reach readers. Right. And he embraced that whole, I yeah. don't care if anyone wants it or not, they'll come, and they did come, and then publishers smarter yeah. publishers anyway, I think it was St. Martin's, yeah. saw that he had a huge readership, yeah. and they signed him to the one book deal for the first uh, first piece of the trilogy yeah. to see how that's gonna go, but that 
has just come out. That came out the end That's of October. That's the Seventh Son. Seventh Son, mm -hmm. yeah. Now, my, my question for you, and because I, I want to talk about Scott Sigler in a second, who's another person who, who podcasts. Um, one of the comments he makes is give it away, give it all away for free, because if you don't give it all away for free, uh, the audience is going to get to a certain point in your book and they're going to say, they're going to have the luxury of saying, okay, I'm not going to finish this because it's never, I'm never going to be able to finish it. I'm going to stop reading. If only the first 10 chapters. Right. So I wonder when you interview Well, that was Hutchins, his concern. Yeah. He said, what did you talk about? The book's done. Yeah. So it's just a matter of if they don't buy the next two, then he'll just continue the podcast. Yeah. Okay. And seeing how the first one was embraced by St. Martin's, he has some so some you, confidence that they'll pick up the other two. I know he put out 10 chapters. Did he put out the whole thing? I think the whole thing's out okay. now. Okay, good. Because that's what I was wondering about. I saw Chris Brogan talk about Hutchins putting out 10 chapters of it. Yeah. And so I immediately, I've been listening to his Scott Sigler keynote where he talks about that, and I wondered, is Hutchins just putting out? No, his plan, is if he hasn't already, is to put it all out. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, so... Scott Sigler is another um, uh, is another one who's doing that. Um, he gave a content delivery keynote at Balticon, um, which I guess is a science fiction convention. Uh, and if you're interested in this topic, you really should go and, and listen to it. It's about an hour long. If you go to scottsigler.com and search part of his bloodcast. Um, and Excuse me, because I'm tweeting about your yeah. talk. So Scott is S I G L E R. Uh, S I G L E R. Yeah, -E -R. yeah. He's at Scott Sigler on the um, uh, on Twitter. Okay. Um, yeah, he uh, gave this great talk, and uh, I'm going to crib some of it here. Um, but go listen to the whole thing if you're interested in the topic. Um, he talks about the difference in the in the models. So uh, the traditional model, and he invents some of these numbers, um, but I think he gets it mostly right. In the traditional, I'm going to go through a main, mainstream publisher model. The publisher takes 90%. The uh, this is these are his numbers. 10% uh, goes to the agent slash author, and 15% of that 10% goes to the agent. Um, so for $10 sold, this again, these are all his numbers. Um, but I think they're they're close. They're close. They're yeah. Close. Um, so for $10 sold, nine goes to the publisher. The agent gets 15 cents, and the author gets 85 cents. Um, and I think our traditional way of looking at it is, well, the publisher's evil. Well, it's not that the publisher's evil. You think about everything the publisher does. They need office space in New York. They need to warehouse the books. They need to do all the distribution. So in the end, they are doing a lot of work for you, and them taking the 90% is, maybe it's excessive, but probably not. It's probably, it's probably pretty fair, uh, given the investment they're putting in. Um, the old formula, and he, he, I don't know why he does, uh, he jumps from $10 to $20 for his next set of examples. So maybe that's a, he said it's not strong in numbers. Um, he goes to $20. 50,000 50, copies is a major home run, is the way he uh, talks about it. Um, if you sell 50,000 copies of a $20 book, you're going to make $1.70 a book. Um, so that comes out to about 85000 So if you had a major home run every year, the rest of your life, you could be through a traditional publisher. You could that could be your job. Eighty-five thousand dollars a year, you live real comfortably. Um, but most first-time authors, again, his numbers, Sigler's numbers, three thousand to five thousand copies for a first-time author. A five thousand is a typical success, and that's eighty-five hundred bucks take home after all the work you've put into it. So. That's when you start when you when you hear that number and he says that. That's when you immediately start thinking, these guys who are podcasting and transforming it and doing it themselves, maybe they're on to something because, you know, as much as there's the prestige of publishing with a big company, there's if I could do it my um, on my own. And one of the things I want to talk about, hope we can talk about it at the end, is you don't have to do it all on your own. If I can surround myself with the right people, the right yeah. an editor book designer. You don't try to do it all yourself. Find the people to work with. Um, but, you know, if you did it as a small conglomerate of, of people rather than through the publisher, you might make a lot more. So he brings up uh, more numbers. Um, with the internet, you can cut out the, cut out the middleman. If you were to go to something like Blurb, uh, I think it's Blurb, um, or CreateSpace, or Lulu, um, or any other number of uh, places where you can publish uh, a small run, um, again, his numbers, 5,000 copies, 
he's estimating about two dollars and fifty cents a unit if you do five thousand. Um, if you sell at twenty dollars the same books that you went and printed yourself, now you're suddenly making sixteen dollars a copy. If you think you can sell the five thousand, and that's eighty thousand right there. If you sell five thousand copies, so suddenly, even but selling five thousand copies ridiculously difficult still, okay. but the numbers start to, to make a lot more sense. Now the 250 cost includes if you use a book designer and printer and then have well, yeah, a I think indexer. If that, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, no, I think 250 probably. It, it's I don't just know. putting your own you image up there own. and doing it yeah. all yourself. Yeah, it's probably doing it yourself. Yeah. But then think about this way. I don't need to make 80. I could be having making 60,000. My wife works too, you know, so yeah. Yeah, if yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. you want to be paid five grand to a designer, five grand here, yeah, five yeah. grand there. If I'm giving away twenty thousand of it to to the editors of this, mm -hmm. I'm still making sixty thousand if I can if I can do that. Um, then he he gets to a point where he says, "What if you can only sell one thousand? Fine, you're still, um, you're still okay." And this gets me into um, uh, Robin Sloan um, ideas on distribution. So we we know the realities now of the of um, traditional publishing versus publishing a book on your own. Um, and Sigur gets into this uh, pre-ordering, right? Um, Robin Sloan uh, did this through Kickstarter, and I, Robin Sloan is Snark Market, is that where he's? I can't remember, but Robin Sloan has an established audience, so take that into consideration. But he goes on to Kickstarter, um, which is a fundraising website. Uh, it's at, at Kickstarter on Twitter, or kickstarter.com, and he says, all right, I'm going to write a murder mystery novel, and I'm going to pre-sell it to all of you, and I'm only going to do this. I'm only going to do it through this. So this is the only time I'm ever going to print it. This is your one chance to get it. For one dollar, you'll get a PDF of the book. Um, for eleven dollars, you got the PDF plus a hard copy, and then increasingly going up in terms of your donations. He set a um, with Kickstarter. You say I'm going to I'm going to try to raise thirty-five hundred dollars. Everyone pledges. If you don't make the thirty-five hundred, you don't you don't get it. So it's basically it's a fundraising mechanism. So he set it at thirty-five hundred. He raised nearly fourteen thousand dollars doing it this way. But he basically was pre-selling the entire run of the book. And what he said was, the more people that order um, the higher levels, or the more people that order the book in general, the better the book is going to be. Right? We can have a pretty simple, at 3500 bucks, we can have a pretty simple, you know, maybe not well designed, but maybe, you know, simple design, whatever. If you guys donate more and more and more, here we go. All of a sudden we're, um, we're getting a much better book, much better quality. I can hire a professional designer. I can do this, do that. Um, and so he pre-sold the entire run. And now he goes out, he uses that 14000 for whatever to, to uh, make the book. And he made fourteen thousand out of it. You know, he's not making the eighty-five, but he—I don't think that was his goal. I think he wanted to—he just wanted to have fun with it. That's my understanding of that project was: I want to write a murder mystery. I want to see if my audience will will buy into it, and I'll make you know fifteen. That's but, but the whole thing with Kickstarter, though, that's by invite only. That's not a public platform. It, it used to be, and now now it's um, now it's open. Are you sure? I think. I think it went open late in the uh, late in September or in October. Kickstarter.com. Kickstarter.com. Yeah, we were trying to get a project down there, and we're still waiting for the. Oh. Back from the Email me because I think I still have some invites. Oh really? <laughs> All right, I will. Yeah, um, I I think I have a couple because um, I got invited by somebody, and I did a I did a Kickstarter project that actually ended up failing, but out of it I managed to get a f new laptop. <laughs> And uh, a microphone, yeah. so it failed on on there. But because it raised awareness, people were like, "Oh, here you go." Because I travel to Boston two or three times a week from Merrimack, New Hampshire, and my laptop couldn't last twenty minutes without a charge. So I, I was like, "I would really love to be working on this novel, but I can't unless I get a laptop." And that all came out of that. So Kickstarter can be useful even if you don't make your you know, if you don't make your goal. And I just pulled it up. But there's a um, looks like some traditional 
books, but also yeah. um, they're raising money for a blip festival that's going on right yeah. now, and an iPhone app. So yeah, people they are, they um there was a guy on there whose yeah. project was I'm going to get the Kinks back together. Yeah. Like it's all sorts of different. <laughs> it, it's all sorts of different. I think it was the Kinks. I might be wrong about that. I feel like it was the Kinks, but there are all sorts of different projects out there, um, and it's an interesting an interesting model. Um, however. Uh, let's see, how are we doing on time? Is that right? Uh, 10.40. 10.38. So, what we start at 10.15? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you ended at 11. That's fine. You have 20 minutes. Okay. Um, consider the rel So, we've got that, the, the book thing. But consider the relevance of the book in modern, in our digital uh, age. Um, Brian Davis uh, is an interviewer. Uh, this is, I found this on kotki.org. Uh, while interviewing Michael Turner, uh, he's the author, uh, says, the book is stalled out in terms of technology uh, at 1500 AD and sociologically at around 1930. And Kotke's like, what does it mean sociologically? And they ended up following up. And he said, literature in book form and discussion around it was the mark of education of the gentry and the petite bourgeoisie. Um, literature in book form never really found a place in mass-produced post-World War II middle-class culture. Now, I'm not sure I totally buy into that. Uh, you know, there are certainly people with lots of books around, and we have the sort of romance novels and things you bring to the beach, and you know, all that stuff's out there. Well, but you have the little communities of people who are doing book clubs. Right? Yeah, it's yeah. I mean, if you want a, if you want a great um, podcast on a weekly basis, discussion of uh, books and it's uh, books magazines out there. Yeah. Well, and another one that I really like is books on the nightstand, okay. um, oh. which is uh, oh gosh. No, I forgot. Um, Ann Kingman and, and uh, Ann's the one I've met. So <laughs> for, I, for, I forgive me for um, for forgetting the other guy's names. Um, but they're both uh, at Random House, and they talk a lot about. Um, although it's their personal opinion, it's not it's not Random House. I love those disclaimers yeah. <laughs> to put at the end. Um, that, that's a great one. Uh, they talk a lot about that. Um, I think it's become hip to say you don't read books anymore. Uh, Absolutely. Well, in the tech in the tech circle, I think I think it has been. Um, Gary Vaynerchuk is number five on in his category on the New York Times bestseller list, yeah. and he's a guy who says I don't read I don't read books. Um, Kotke is another guy who's recently said I don't I don't read books. You know, I, and he's got two kids now, and he's still blogging full. I mean, I, there's a certain point at which okay, I don't have time to read books. Um, so it's become kind of. Uh, Kind of hip to say you don't read books. So um, if you were to not to move us a little no, off sorry. of the theoretical, yeah. But if you were to talk to people who wanted to publish in the environment we're in now, yeah. what advice would you give them? I, mean, I would, yeah. Sorry, and I didn't mean to get to go too theoretical for so long. Um, what I would say, listen to that um, Sigler podcast because it gives a lot of great ideas. Um, Electronic really is kind of a way to go. I think the Hutchins model, the Sigler model of podcasting and or giving away the content for free to build audience and then selling the selling the product at the end yeah. um, is, is a model to explore. Well, because Sigler talks about the fact that he had people who listened to the entire podcast of this novel for free. And still went they, bought. they went and bought the book. They never opened the book. But it doesn't matter to him, they may someday, what it doesn't really matter to him because what it ends up being is it's loyalty. It's, okay, I really enjoy what you gave me for free. Here, I'm gonna, right. I'm gonna go out there. Yeah. Um, Some of the models, I talked to Mark Janot at a uh, tech conference a year and a half ago, I guess. Yeah. And he's the editor of Popular Science Magazine. Mm -hmm. He's the managing editor over there. And he said that the magazine he is headed towards electronics. Yeah. And it'll be the same sort of model you talked about before, where if I want to get that magazine in my mailbox, mm -hmm. get that physical magazine, yeah. then I will be paying right. $5 an issue. Yeah. And it'll cost me 50 bucks a year to get the yeah. issues. But, uh, but he's going to set it up as a PDF mm -hmm. or PDF-esque model online, where you still pay your $12 a year yeah. for every, ep uh, every right. issue. It gets mailed to you. The ads are embedded in the format. You still read it on a screen, yeah. or you can print it out if you wanted to, but that way it's going to go away from the physical model, and you're not paying the printing, the mailing costs, yeah. the 
gas costs, any of that stuff, and it keeps the magazine alive. Right. And, and I just stumbled on the a lot of the new e-readers, mm -hmm. like the Barnes and Noble one yeah, that you can download yeah. from here and here. Yeah. It supports PDFs. Yeah. So you can automatically well, the send Kindle it out as a PDF. And Kindle's going to open up at some point. Yeah, it's yeah. going to no. open up. But the, the, the free download, though, that yeah. you can download off Barnes & Noble, supports PDFs. So, right. you know, it would be easy to publish as a PDF. And yeah. just send Here's it what I think about the Kindle, and I think Amazon is realizing it by releasing a software for the PC and eventually soon for the Mac. Um, oh, they already have it on the iPhone? Yeah, and they have it on the iPhone. Kaki brings this up. Sure, fine, make your single-use devices, but all these e-readers, the Kindle, Nook, Sony Reader, et al., are all focused on the wrong single-use books. Um, and, uh, and he goes on to say, uh, the correct single-use is reading, right? Um, your device should make it equally easy to read books, magazine articles, newspapers, websites, RSS feeds, PDFs, etc. And keep in mind, all of these things have images that are integral to the re reading experience. We want to read it, help us do it. So the Kindle is, you can read your, your books on it, you can read certain newspapers, you can read blogs that people have bothered to, to go through their process, but it is a single use thing and it's centered around books. The iPhone or your other, your other smartphones can do everything, right? And so uh, going back to Sigler, and he talks about this in that, um, in that podcast, there are 500,000 Kindles sold in 2008. Compare that to 20 million iPhones and iPod Touches sold in the last two years. He's recording this at the beginning of this year. So, um, and 3.9 billion uh, cell phones in the last uh, nine quarters. So he's talking first. He's in, he's giving the speech in first quarter of uh, 2009. Uh, so there are lots more. The the Kindle right now is statistically insignificant. And what we need to focus on is. Yes, get it on the Kindle, but also get it everywhere. You know, get it out in PDF, uh, get it on your website. PDF may not even be the best option because if somebody's trying to get it on their phone, which, you know, how many of us have phones compared to how many of us have Kindles, right? If somebody's going to get it on their phone, we want to make it easy for them to get it on their phone. So maybe HTML, maybe whatever. Um, so I want, I, I would, my suggestions for people doing it is. Get it out there um, and make it easy to get. Um, if you're going to go free, don't go half-assed free, I think. I think Sigmar makes a great point about that, and, and Hutchins is doing it. Um, absolutely sort of commit yourself to giving it away for free. Build the audience and hope for the best. I, that's kind of bad. That's a bad way of putting it. Um, have a plan in place to try and make the make the money on it, but um. what do you what do you think about some? I, I've noticed a lot lately with uh, some of the people that I've followed their blogs mm -hmm. regularly for years. Yeah, and you know, after three or four years of writing a blog on either a topic or just you know general musings and ideas, mm -hmm. they'll package up everything that they've already written and sell it as a book. Yeah, and I get frustrated when I go and I buy, you know, they don't, they never say it's like brand new material or anything yeah. like that, but they don't really advertise it as a rehash of the web, and then I, you know, I buy a $15 book and I open it up and I realize I've, I've read all of this, so yeah. I was looking for something, you know, I was attracted to that author because mm. of what I had been reading right. over these years, but then essentially what I'm now looking at is a hard copy of their, yeah. their blogs, I, I mean, I, I love um, I love Crush It. I think it's a great it's a great book, Gary Vaynerchuk's book. But when I'm re when I read it, I was sitting I was sitting there thinking, well, this is the hard this is sort of the hard copy of everything he's been telling me on his sort Wine of library TV. Yeah. Uh, Wine Library TV or his Gary V uh, videos online. But I don't mind because it's this for me. It becomes the same thing that people are doing with Sigler and Hutchins at these fiction writers. They're consuming the content for free. I've consumed Gary's content for free for a couple of years. So now me buying Gary's book is me saying thank you. Okay. I think he okay. talks about it as uh, he's doing the book tour and he talk, talks about the thank you economy. You know, um, And I think that's sort of where you head to. 
I, I want to follow up with him because when I saw him at Barnes and Noble uh, in Boston when he came around the, the afternoon before he, he came and did your show, um, he tried to create this word and he tried to create the word frustumer, which was meant to be friend and customer, but it sounds oh, frustrated, yeah, yeah. Frustrated, yeah. frustrated customer. Yeah. And I want to follow up with him because I really think we need to come up with a word for that because he made a great point that what we're doing as writers or as content producers is we're building relationships with people that are somewhere between friend and customer. They, they're not quite, they're not gonna be quite customer. Everyone wants to feel kind of, I'm not, maybe not everyone, but I think a lot of people out there want to feel a connection with the person that they're supporting that goes beyond customer. Um, I don't know what the reason for that is, but we, we want connections with everyone. We want, you know, celebrity culture and all of that. We want to know what's going on. We want to be friends with, with the people we're, we're buying stuff from, I think. And I think as content producers, uh, which I don't know, I don't really like that. As, as a fiction writer, I want, to, I want to be friendly with the people that, I'm, that are reading my work. You know, and if, if, I have to build a, if I have to build my audience one person at a time, I think that's okay. I think that's, what I, I think that's the reality of it. Um, and it's gonna, if you build that audience one person at a time, then I think you're building a much more loyal audience. That that would be uh, that would be my thought. You know, mm -hmm. I don't watch every episode of Wine Library TV, but uh, I met Gary briefly at a wine event a few years ago, and I watched a, watched it regularly for a few months. Then started watching his videos, and now I'll come back and back and forth. But he always, when I get, come back to it, I always feel like I'm being treated like that that friend relationship. Um, and that, you know, he's doing it on a much more massive scale than I think I'll be doing it anytime soon, but um, I really like that. You know, people have come back and forth. I've formed that frustumer relationship. Uh, I, I want to work for it too. Although I think frustumer is fun to say. And then you can have that argument about what, does it sound like, here's a bit of wordplay. Is it frustrated customer or frustrating customer? Because when I because, because when I put it out there on Twitter that afternoon, that I got equal response. Some people, especially people who work in retail or at Starbucks or whatever, were That's coming back, and it was they were like frustrating customers, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the rest of the people were frustrated. Well, I think that's a perfect example of somebody who's um, using all of the tools in the toolbox, traditional printing because of traditional publishing, but then use social media to really sell his book. And yeah. Then, you know, if you can find a way to package the traditional and use all these new tools, then I think yeah. that you have an advantage. But to, to your point, too, about reprinted books, um, you know, Nora Roberts is a big thing with my mom, you know, yeah. so and finding out that I think she didn't own her original copyrights, and mm. now she's got to put a stamp on her book that says this is really a new yeah. release and huh. uh, that kind of stuff. So I, I just don't think, I just tweeted out, you know, do you think Kindles and iPhones and computers will ever replace real books? I don't see anybody ever cuddling up with a Kindle. No, that, that, yeah. and, and Sigur makes that point in, in his uh, keynote, too. Uh, eventually, you want a, a Kindle or an iPod doesn't smell nice. You know, it doesn't smell like a book, and you can't, you can't cuddle up with it. So eventually, you want that. But we want that. And I, if we were downstairs in the in the session they're doing on, on digital natives and... Yeah. Do they want, I mean, I think to a certain extent they might like the smell of a book eventually, but they want, um, they just want it. They, they want, want it they want to be able to read it. Right. What we have to get around, I think, and this is the key point I want to get to, is the core of our art form as, as authors is storytelling, right? And that goes beyond uh, book form, podcast, you know, it goes back to just telling stories across a campfire. You know, so we need to forget about it. We need to be everywhere, but also be sort of platform agnostic, I guess. You know, is it put it out as a podcast, put it out as a PDF, put it out as an actual book. Put it out so that anybody can consume it the way they want to consume it. Um, a great figure that comes in terms of talking about um, the what the digitally what the what the younger generation wants. Um, ten novels in on Japan's bestseller list started off as free phone novels, 10, ten of the novels yeah. in there. And so that's what, the, and of course,
they're way ahead of us. But that kind of culture might come. Well, because they're all on the train and yeah. they're all listening yeah. through headphones mm -hmm. on their. Yeah. They don't have like real smartphones per se, but they're right. phones that can get audio. I mean, they all have micro SD cards and they'll download the stuff at home and throw it in the phone. And so it's I an mean, audio book. It's audio. We want we want the nice smell of the book, and hopefully p kids will get to appreciate that at some point. But if they don't, they don't. It goes back to your point about the the Kindle and the reader and all this, yeah. and they were talking about making a book. And yeah. you're saying no, the commonality is, is reading. The commonality. So the commonality is the storytelling. Yeah, I so see. So you yeah. can tell a story with whatever vehicle, just be happy and right. maybe you can monetize it. I think yeah. it goes back to our children, though. Let me tell you, they opened on October 31st a $1 million library in towns in Massachusetts, in my town. $1 million. On Friday, they walked 30-some preschoolers across the lawn to visit the library. They wanted the preschoolers to yeah. be the first ones as a class to visit the brand new library. And I walked in that classroom on Friday before I drove up here. And I looked at five of them and I said, so how's the library? They go, we loved it. It was so big and the books were so neat and everything. So I think like making sure our kids are still reading that way is the most important. Yeah. I mean, I take my kids to Barnes and Noble all the time. Yeah. I have my e-reader. I know what I, what I can download, but I tell you what, my my books for college and I still go to the library and I still make sure my children have their library cards. Yeah. Yeah. Barnes and Noble does a really much better job than Borders in setting up a kid area where you can just go lie down in your belly yeah. and read books. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I think it depends on the story. I've seen one or two Borders that have a great children's area, but I think you're right. In general, mm -hmm. a lot of the Barnes and Nobles have a sort of, not fenced it's off, blocked off. It's blocked off. Yeah. 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 Well, Cushing Academy just got rid of all the books in their yeah. library. $35,000 a year for high school, and there's not one book in the library that's oh. all digital. I, just, I have a little, little story to share with you. I come from a very small town in upstate New York, and I have to make them over Halloween. And I have a little niece who is just turning two. Um, and I was just overjoyed when I heard that the library in town still does the afternoon readings for children. I couldn't believe, because I had, you know, since I've been in Boston, I just figured, oh, that, you know, I hadn't heard of Story Hour in years. And it's packed, and the, the unbelievable thing, the add-on to that, I guess it's the value add if you want, but we still have a little AM station in our town, and they still do a, a Saturday night story reading over oh the air that so cool. is in line with yeah. what they're actually reading during the day. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, we're, my town is stuck in <laughs> the 50s. <laughs> where, I mean, you, you say what you want about it, but I yeah. was amazed that there's still pockets of areas where, like, the old school technology yeah. and the way that these things are, these children are still growing up They've got a foot in both worlds, if you will. They've got the old school way, you know, her, every, all of her grandparents have the Kindles and, you know, she'll sit with them and just look at it. She's not reading it yet, but, she, I mean, w what an interesting way to grow up and see I think sort of the transposition that. of that. I mean, that's good. I guess, suppose that's getting off track, but I think that's ideal. I mean, yeah. I, we have tons of books in, in our house. I have one daughter and uh, another on the way, and uh, we try to keep lots of books around, but you know, then we have the computer there, and we let her play with the computer, and I let her play with my phone. Um, but I think it, I mean, I don't know, I'm not a parenting expert. I would love it if all kids were out there getting a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. um, That's not reading, and I think what's gonna end up happening is they're still gonna have to use traditional reading methods, because kids learn either by touching, yeah. or seeing, or hearing. So they're still gonna have to provide all those opportunities. Yeah. We can't go totally digital. And, and the average kid learns during, read between four and seven. So what they're trying to do now, teaching kids to read in kindergarten, is totally counterproductive. But I think it's gonna, it's gonna be. I mean, my husband and I, my husband's kept a reading list since 1983, uh -huh. but right now it's like 50 pages long uh -huh. with a self spreadsheet of every book he's ever read. Yeah. <laughs> wow. He has a, he has a way when he tucks his shirt in. Our friends left. He he tucks his shirt in between the the back of his pants and the inside of his shirt. Yeah. And never goes anywhere without a book. My dad was a newspaper writer. My mother was a teacher. Yeah. And we we have a genetic anomaly of a child who hates to read. <laughs> but he'll go on the computer for hours. Yeah. So I, you're right. You have to meet them where they are. Yes. But I think um, you know the husband with the book all the time 
is asking around about a Kindle because he flies to China in 14 hours and he'll go for two weeks and he'll take eight paperbacks with him. So for him, a Kindle would be a good thing. Oh, Whether or not he can put it down the back of his can. Yeah, that's true. Right. Yeah. I think a Kindle, I mean, I would love to have a Kindle. They're, they're kind of, I think the thing, the thing about a Kindle right now is they're priced beyond most, as a single use device, I think it's priced beyond where most people are, are going to go. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, the new brand of Nova is the Nook. The Nook, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 um, oh, so just a, just a minute or two left. Um, I just wanted to bring up a couple of other points um, quickly. Bakker Online, this, this came out this week, I saw this. 21% of fiction book purchases in 2008 were based on online awareness. So that's another important one to. So. Even if you're, yeah, even if 21% of fiction book purchases in 2008 were based on online awareness. That was from Bokker, uh, B O W K E R online. Um, so even if we're going to go the traditional route, yeah. we need to be on one. Maybe. And that's a year old. That yeah. figure's a year old. So and so it probably it only increases. It might be 50% now. Yeah. Um, and that's just people they survey, you know. Right. That's pe just people who answer surveys, and uh, you know. Um, so I think be where they are. Um, the, the final thing, final thing I wanted to touch on um, is collaboration. I touched on that before, but I think there is a there is a there is room for a lot of sm small ones of these. I the example that I come back to because I'm a comic book reader. Uh, is the Image Comics in 1992 was founded by seven illustrators who got together and basically broke the mold of comics publishers. They were the biggest illustrators of the time. They got together, told all of their own stories. Now, a lot of their stories were pretty derivative of the stories they were already telling. Still, they captured the number two spot. Um, you know, Marvel and DC are the sort of big publishers in comics, but they were number two pretty quickly. Um, just by doing that. And I'm not saying that we should aim to be number two or, or aim to be J.K. Rowling or any of these things, but if we get together with the designer that we know, the best designer that we know, and the best editor that we know, and the best marketing person, and we form these sort of five or six person teams of people who, and then you know three or four writers, and we all work together, the power of, I think writing is very solitary, and there's this, if I'm going to go out and go out go it alone, I want to go it totally alone and do it all myself, and that's not the way to do it. I think I think creating teams of people who are great at what they do is maybe the way to go, and that helps you eliminate some of that stigma of self-publishing that I started off talking to. Because if you have a great editor and you have a great marketing person, and you have this team of people who all believe in the book, not only do you sort of get that respect, but I think people say. So not only do you get that respect, but you have all those people's individual networks too. The more people that get involved, Fine. okay, thanks. Yeah. So the more people that get involved, um, the the bigger the audience, the 